the silly little show that my kids used to watch on PBS, one of the songs was, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm just doing it. And yeah. it plays in my head all day, every day, because you just, you're not gonna be the expert. You can do this job for 50 years and still be blindsided. I mean, just surveying an easement this week. I didn't know how to do that this week, but I was like, I'm gonna learn how, and I'm gonna be the expert. And if anybody has a question, you can come ask me. Um, and I didn't know how, and it's okay to not know how, and it's okay to always ask dumbest questions because chances are somebody else was too scared to ask it, and now I have the information and they don't, and that's why I'll be better. So the question is this, how do most agents succeed in today's competitive real estate market when all the successful agents are keeping the secrets to themselves? So that's the question, and this podcast will give you the answer. I interview agents from all over the world. I ask them their tactics, and they share all of their secrets with me so we can give them to the world. I'm Aaron Amuchastegui, and welcome to Real Estate Rockstars. Real Estate Rockstars, this is Aaron Amuchastegui. Hey, we are about to record an awesome, awesome interview. Amy Rogers and I have been chatting for the last couple of minutes, and it's just been so fun so far getting to hear about uh, her listening to the podcast and how much fun she's had in her first couple of years of real estate. I think you guys are going to get a lot out of this. So Amy Rogers from Minot, North Dakota. Did I say it right, Amy? That is correct. Minot, North Dakota. Minot, North Dakota. At least Ro- I knew I was going to get Amy Rogers right. That's a lot easier to pronounce than, than Minot, for sure. Yes, that's my claim to fame is... My name is easy to spell and pronounce, which I'm sure you've uh, encountered some difficulty with your last name over the years. <laughs> I sure have. The I, like, the benefit is there, there's one of me. The problem is if, if I'm trying to tell people how to spell my name, it doesn't over the phone. Like it never comes out right because there's too many, too many tough letters in there. How long have you been an agent, Amy? Um, about 21 months. I got my license about 21 months ago. So less than two years. Just a baby. 21 months. So middle of 2021. Yeah. Yeah, March of, yeah, March. Uh, yeah, yeah. Whoops. Brand new. Brand spanking new. <laughs> Brand new. What made you want to be a real estate agent? Um, So kind of started back during COVID, of course. COVID uh, changed everybody's lives. Some people for the better, some for the worse. Um, I started flipping furniture, which is a weird way to cope with um, quarantine, having four young kids at home and homeschooling. Started flipping furniture. All the stores were closed, but the yard sales weren't. So I'd buy a crappy dresser, sell it on Facebook for like $80, make $60 flipping furniture. It was a weird way to do things. And then I renovated our house. And then my husband had a harebrained scheme of, hey, let's uh, let's never leave North Dakota and let's build a real estate empire. Um, so we started buying investment properties. We moved a handful of times using our VA loan and turning those into rentals as well. Um, we just rent out a handful of properties and then the real estate agent that we'd been working with, um, her husband, who was active duty military, moved. So um, she encouraged me to get my license and beginning of 2021, I started the real estate courses. And then by mid-March, I had my license, a handful of listings and a couple of buyers and just kind of took off from there. Yeah. So, So what was your day job before COVID? So before, before 2021, so the, so everything gets shut down now, did, and did you start homeschooling during that time or, or were you already homeschooling? I've been a stay at home mom for a dozen years. I got, I got the best job in the world. I got to stay home and raise my four babies. And then once the schools shut yeah. down, all those, those four babies that were in public school came, came home <laughs> and yeah. uh, it was, it was great. I loved being able to homeschool them for that period of time, but it's tough when the parks are closed and friends' houses are closed. It got a little claustrophobic in our our actual tiny home. And um, so to decompress, uh, we turned to renovating houses. When did you guys move to North Dakota? We've been here for six years. Okay. Yeah, so we so moved, moved there six years ago. 2016. Yeah, 2000, end of 2016. Yeah. That's I'm our just seventh trying to look on winter. the map to see if... If we hit North Dakota when we were, we did a road trip. Um, oh, that's right. You guys have an RV. an RV. We have an RV. It's so much fun. Yes, we got our RV during COVID. We hit all these states. 
South Dakota was as close as we got. We we started on the east side, went through the west, and you know we surrounded it. Though we got up into Montana, we didn't go to Minnesota, we didn't go to North Dakota. So those will be on the list. We got pretty Missed close it. on that first that first route up there. Oh, that's a great place. So, so you started to learn about real estate essentially. So you're flipping furniture because you're like, hey, life is slowed down. We can't do the same amount of stuff. Almost as like a hobby. So you're out there, you go to a garage sale, you're like, wait, I think this is probably worth something. So you put it on Facebook. So you start to get like a first taste of like being an entrepreneur, like hustling for an extra dollar. And it's probably kind of fun. And, and, you know, and you're like, all right, cool. 60 bucks that buys us, buys us lunch today, it buys us dinner today. And, and that was pretty fun. And then you guys started, you know, did your own renovations and then said, let's get into real estate. And you wanted to go bigger into real estate at that point. So when you got your license, so January 2021, you start taking the classes. March 2021, you're licensed. How do you get your first deal? My first, um, my very first listing that I ever had was actually a furniture customer. Um, <laughs> she bought furniture from me and she thought that was enough experience to sell her house. Um, and I got a handful of referrals from other um, agents who didn't live up here, who had left and were sending me some business. Buying clients, the very first buying client I ever got, what, well, the very first house I ever bought was my own, um, was a, an investment property. And um, I'm, the name of our little investment company is Yellow Door Homes. So we paint all of our ho- our little doors yellow. It's adorable. Yeah. Um, so by having that yellow door notoriety and me renovating the houses myself with our four kids by my side and putting that on social media... People saw us as the the yellow door weirdos and <laughs> and they kind of I kind of grew that business and grew that notoriety by having that well known branding. And our community is pretty small; it's only about fifty thousand people. So to take these distressed properties and to turn them around and make them look good, we kind of built up a little bit of an image with that. And I do know a lot about houses, and I love our community and to see houses turn into homes is it's a it's a great little process so how did you so your first client's a furniture customer which means like you bought furniture from somebody else and sold it to them on craigslist and somehow they that converted that you could be a real estate agent was that because they saw on social media where you were like like did you tell them hey i'm an agent too or did it just like you just connected from that and then they saw your other presence like like how did they find out you were an agent they just kind of connected it. Um, social media, mostly. That's a lot of it. Um, we're not from here. We're not from North Dakota. We don't have our, we don't have deep roots. We don't have a lot of family. We have no family here. Um, so we don't have those high school buddies. Uh, but we do have, um, people who do trust our, our brand and they trust me to guide them through real estate transactions. But a lot of that was by, showing our renovations on social media, showing my my then eight-year-old ripping up carpets, our 10-year-old painted an entire house herself. So to show that, because it's fun, it's cute, it's sweet. And and I'm not shoving it down people's throat that I renovate houses and I want to sell houses for you and with you. Um, it, it, it landed well. It landed well. And that's kind of how it got out there that I had my real estate license. But mostly I just got my real estate license for our investments. But when people noticed that I was um, doing a good job with it and I was a hustler and they knew I would work hard for them, it kind of uh, kind of caught fire from there. When my wife, when my wife first got licensed, it was just to sell my properties. Right. I was buying them. I was fixing them. She got licensed to sell them. We're like, Hey, we got to use a, we got to, we got to use a broker. We got to pay a broker. It might as well, um, be you. Mm-hmm. And the, and it was like that for a long time, right? Before it mm-hmm. led to anything else or any other listings or any other sorts of clients. Um, so it's a great way to get a foot in the door when you have kind of a source, right? You're out there buying for yourself and you're fixing and you're selling. And at that time, you said your social media, You weren't blasting to people of, you weren't saying like, hey, hire me as your agent, but you were showing them proof of your real estate knowledge out there. And so I think a lot of agents, we can do that all sorts of ways. And we've had a lot of people talk about that of like, just doing a video of like putting a sign in the, in the, in the, 
you know, the grass out in front of a house or when people are doing videos saying like, Hey, I'm doing an open house today. Like you're not going to get very many people that are going to show up because you did that video. But now people are going to know you're out there doing your thing. Or if you're out there like cleaning up, like some of the stuff that isn't as exciting of like, Oh, I'm cleaning up this listing today or look at this one. Anytime you can like show expertise, subtly show expertise or knowledge um, that has to help. And it sounds like that helped with Amy. So the, so how many deals did you do your first year? So the very first nine months, so it wasn't even a full year. So the, my first nine months, I closed uh, six, uh, 36 sides, and that was $6.8 million in nine months. 36 sides, $6.8 million. What's the average sales price there? About $200,000? 240000 is in, in my market. Okay, so two, so $240,000 houses on average. Now, in that first year, how many of them were ones that you bought, that you were the buyer and the seller also? And how many were other clients? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, so, Offer. yeah. Oh, so dual agency, a, a good chunk. Good chunk was dual agency. And then um, not quite half, probably about a third I was able to do dual agency on. Yeah. But did you, I, I guess what I mean is like, were you the buyer? You were the, inv- like, how many were you the investor on? Nine. nine, nine, cool. Yes. So yes. the so you were able to. It wasn't even a like so not even like a third, right? So you were right. You were the investor on like on like on nine of the deals, and that mm-hmm. was how you got some stuff. But just by doing those for yourself, doing your fix and flips, putting that out there, people said, "Hey, can you help me buy one?" And then what about twenty twenty two? So how how did your volume grow in twenty twenty two? I pretty much doubled sides. I was at sixty seven sides. For 2022 with 14 million. Yeah, which is great, right? There's so many people out there right now that if, if they could imagine that getting that sometime in the next 18 months, they could get up to be doing 60 sides, they could be getting up to 12, 14 million. Like that's a goal. That's that's like a goal that people are getting to. And listeners out there, if you've had a slow first couple of years and you want to be able to do that in the next 18 months, I think it's possible even as our market changes, or if you're brand new and you're trying to figure out what's realistic and, you know, and what are we looking at? Um, you know, Amy's got some really good stats to show, especially because you said there was like 50,000 people in the town you live in, right? So out of 50,000 people, you know, being new there, you, you've been able to generate enough uh, transaction to, to see what's next. What do you think is going to happen for your numbers this year, 2023? I have such a hard... It's hard to know for me because we just don't know what the market's going to do. So I'm not really focused too much on my volume goal or my size goal. I'm just kind of hunkering down on market share. So I was about uh, 3% of the market, just me alone with transactions. So it would be, I would like to push it up to 5%. I'm just focusing on, because I don't know, we just don't know what's going to happen this year. So um, it's going great. I'm off to a good start. I mean, a million in a month is pretty good considering it's the slow season and we're supposed to be in a little bit of a down market. Um, so I'm just focusing more on carving out more of the market for myself. Yeah. And agents listening, I think that's a really simple calculation you guys can do right now. You can go to 2022 and say, what was my market share? You can go to 2021 and say, what was your market share? You figure out how many of the closings happened in your area. And, and it's really whatever you want your market to be. Some people are like, hey, um, I am was this level in my county. I was this level in my city. It was this level in my zip code. But you should do that based on whatever you want your target to be. Some people only want to buy and sell in certain zip codes. Some people only want to buy and sell in certain cities. And some people only want to buy and sell in, super, super, in certain counties. Right. And there was a time in, in Northern California, counties are pretty close together. So there was a period of, over, over like seven counties was where my wife was my listing broker. Right. And so we covered a whole bunch of areas. And, we're, and I met some other people during that time that were like, no, they only focus on one city because they want to master that. So there's lots of ways to do the real estate business. But for listeners that are out there right now, wherever you decide your your market is, price point, zip code, city, whatever, go, these are, this is the stuff that I want to buy and sell. Go calculate your market share from last year and then calculate this year. Because this year can get pretty discouraging some of the time if you're focused on your numbers, if you're focused on your revenue and you're focused on volume. So much of us talk about volume. It's one of the first questions we ask on here, right? But I like that idea that Amy's uh, transitioning that over to just straight market share. When I interviewed Eric Bramlett uh, a couple months ago from Austin, he talked about how much market share he grew back in like, you know, 08, 
oh nine, you know, when everything had slowed down. And then in 2012, when, when the market got good, he had gained so much more. So I think that's a great goal to put into place. And I think that it can probably help when we're getting discouraged of, Hey, we're doing less deals, but now we're doing 5% of the total deals out there. So even though my, even though my, I'm not doing as much as last year, I'm doing better than the average agent uh, in my area, or I've, or I've adjusted faster than the average agent. So right. what are the things that you're doing to try to grow market share right now? Um, so historically I've had some good luck with online leads. I started, I closed my very first Zillow lead in April, this past April. So just a few months ago. And, um, I've closed 15 since then. So in that amount of time, I was able to convert these Zillow leads to closings. But the trick was I didn't buy my own zip code. I didn't buy in the the city of 50,000 people. I bought up by the Canada border. I bought in Sherwood, North Dakota. And each one of those zip codes, I had 50 zip codes at one point, and some of them were a dollar a piece. So the ROI was nuts. <laughs> so yeah. My, my, yeah, so my GCI just on my Zillow last year was 73,000. Just in those few months was 73,000. And the ROI was 24 times what I was putting into it. Um, so... When I mean, sure, I was I drove an hour and a half one way to sell a house for twelve thousand dollars. That is that is a poor use of time, <laughs> but yep. that was one of my sixty seven sides, and that was a touch point, and that's a contact, and it's about gaining the experience and gaining some traction and closing those deals, and no deal is too small. Hey guys, a quick commercial break here, but don't worry, this one is only going to run for the next two or three episodes. I talk so much about the mastermind. It's one of my passions, getting everybody to come hang out in Austin where I get to meet you guys. Well, we just had it, you know, a few weeks ago and we decided for next year we were going to do pre-sales. We're only selling 70 tickets total for the whole country. And that way we keep it nice and small where everybody meets everybody and the end of it, it's like a big giant family. Well, we put out the pre-sales last week and in the during the pre-sales, we sold more than 60 tickets. So there's less than 10 spots left. 10 spots left if you want to join us for the mastermind for next year. We're putting the date so far out there. You've got no excuses um, to be able to know that the date works. You can put it in your calendar now. And we also set up a payment plan for people to break it up into four easy payments. So if you're one of those people that have thought about going to the mastermind, have never pulled the trigger, now's the time. And it's for it's for March for next year. But you got to go sign up now if you want that spot. I don't like selling. I don't like advertising. So we figured we would knock it out quickly. We'd knock it out you know, this first couple weeks in April for next year. So instead of working on that, we're going to focus on value. If you do join the mastermind, you get to be a uh, join part of our private Facebook group where we do monthly zoom calls, where we do tactics on those calls. They're really small. There's like, you know, between 10 and 20 people on those. So you get to ask lots of questions and learn from experts. So if you are interested in signing up, go to real estate, rockstars, network.com forward slash mastermind real estate rockstars network.com forward slash mastermind go lock in your ticket we have less than 10 spots left you can break it up into four payments so that way it is much easier to to be sure to join and i promise you it is the least expensive mastermind out there for the type of stuff that we're doing you know the go abundance masterminds that i talk about that i'm a part of cost five times what we do for this and i try to deliver twice as much value all right back to the podcast I like that hack of trying to find the places in Zillow where they're essentially you get more bang for your buck. And the, you know, a guy that I just interviewed talk about working, you know, is going to work twice as hard this year for half the amount of money. Mm -hmm. And the, and that can be an example of that, right? Like being able to expand to these other zip codes going outside your normal area. I don't like competition in anything that I do. If I'm trying to buy a house or sell a house or, you know, do any of my businesses, I don't like competition. Cause I'm not really good at competing against others. There's certain things that I can do that might give me an edge. Mm -hmm. But what I really like is finding businesses or industries or cities or, or zip codes or whatever that we don't have competition in, that mm -hmm. nobody's actually competing against us. Right. And some of those smaller markets that the, again, very low risk, but when they do come in, you get, you're paying a buck a month and buck a week, whatever, and you get one transaction a year out of that. And then being able to turn that one sale, right, that $12,000 sale into a referral sometime in the next year, mm -hmm. or and then that'll turn into three referrals sometime in the next three to five years. And so mm -hmm. it definitely grows no matter how you get them in. Do you use a CRM or a tracking system as a follow-up to try to, you know, 
get future, get past clients to do more deals? Um, the best or the worst CRM doesn't matter if you don't use it. So <laughs> uh, yeah. I've tried a few different ones and I'm just, I'm not that good at it. I'm not that good at sitting down and learning, tra- learning technology. That's definitely my, my biggest weakness is just trying to figure out how do these things work. I've used Real Geeks and Brevity, and right now I'm using Follow Up Boss. Follow Up Boss, I definitely like the price point, and it's the it's a little bit more intuitive than what I've used in the past. It's not nearly as bulky, uh, but I definitely uh, I've tried a few. But uh, like I said, if you're not taking the time and making that a priority, it doesn't matter which one you're using, <laughs> and that's definitely a weakness I've had. Yeah. That's a lot of the conversations I've had lately with people is the, especially it's figuring out. And one of the gals I just interviewed talked about you should be able to close essentially 10% of your past deals every year. If you follow up with them properly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I thought that yeah. was really a fascinating number and a fascinating goal to the, yeah, whether it's a fancy CRM or whether it's a spreadsheet or whether it's a calendar reminder, like, you know, people, you can have a calendar reminder that's just three months from now that you're going to reach out to anybody you've done a deal with that mm-hmm. day and send an email and give them an update about what you're doing, mm-hmm. whether it's a fancy mm-hmm. newsletter or not. Like there's ways you can do it where after 30 days, they get this and you have 30 days post close and six months post close and nine months. Post, and that's better, right? Like all that's all those systems. There's a bunch of different systems and there is like this a plus version that really, really helps. But if you aren't technology people and you don't really like using the CRMs, you know, finding something that's a little bit, lighter and or even a calendar and a spreadsheet just reaching back out to that sphere you know, I, the, right. I talked to a guy yesterday he's going back out to all the zillow deals he closed in the last few years because he's never put them into a crm he paid for leads right. he closed the deal oh, and then that was it and then now he's like wait i've got hundreds of people out there that i'm missing out and he said i should close 10 percent of those a year oh i need to mm-hmm. start reaching out i need to go back and i need to reach out to those people um so i can see you know, what they're doing next. So I like that. So now over this year, is, is Zillow your big goal? Is is outreach your big goal? Like how are you going to do your deals in 2023? Right. The thing about Zillow, it's just not scalable because it's just, it's it's going to generate what it generates. Um, so I've really started to put more focus on social media. It is free. Just do it. And building up Instagram and uh, Facebook because that's just where everybody is. It's, it's just, unfortunately, that's where people live and just building up that presence and making sure that I'm not shoving down their throat that I will buy and sell your house. Let me buy and sell your house. But I, I genuinely enjoy real estate and I, I work very hard for each one of my clients. Their stress is my stress. Their gain is my gain. Um, their failure, unfortunately, is also my failure. And I, I, I really internalize their, their wins and their successes. So um, I, I want to make sure that that's what I'm communicating. And also, I, I do know so much. I know my brain is just full of real estate information that uh, it's, it's really hard to get that captive audience. So it's, it's fun to go on social media and just to say, this is, this is what we've got going on today. This is the house that um, I was able to help this person who bought their house. Now I'm able to help them sell it for a profit. So that's, it's, a, it's a fun game. It's a very fun game. Yeah. What's something you know now you wish you would have known when you first got licensed? Fire clients. <laughs> yeah. If I mean, just your time and your money, there's, there's always going to be a return on investment. And even if you think you can eventually close somebody for a good dollar amount, the amount of joy and time that they will, that will rob you is it's genuine. It's generally not worth it. And I had an agent very, very, very early on tell me, she's like, just fire them. Let them be somebody else's headache. Turn around and sell two more houses. in that amount of time that you've dealt with them trying to spoon feed them one. So that was, that's very helpful. And, uh, get over the failed sales. <laughs> I wish yeah. I'd known that early on because they're just going to happen. It's part of it. You're, I mean, it's getting something under contract is step one of 5,000. So um, they're going to happen and to not, to not be so, so distraught about it. That's great advice because there are so many times it's like we got a, as a seller, as a buyer, like we got that offer accepted. And if you need to celebrate every one of those moments, but then it's like also like, mm-hmm. but get back to work. 
Mm-hmm. When we were flipping like yeah. 30 or 30 or 40 houses a month, we always knew we had this crazy time and these crazy spreadsheets as we're going like, well, here's our goal. But we knew that we were net, even though we had 30 in escrow on January 1st, we knew that we weren't going to close 30 in the next 30, 30 days. It just wasn't going to happen. Even if they were all supposed to, even if we ended up closing them all, we were never going to close them all on time. You know, there was going to be different things that pushed them. And it's really easy to get discouraged. And it's really easy for people to play the what if game. The what if, like, what if I'd have done more deals last year? What if I'd have invested better last year when the market was stronger and now I'm now I'm stuck and I don't have as much money? Or yeah, what if, you know, when that one fails? Because there's also clients that you could work with for a year and then they give and then they're like, okay, I'm not actually gonna buy a house now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one hundred percent. That's fairly oh, yeah. common. We get to the point, mm-hmm. I'm like, all right, we're done. Like that's it's not gonna happen anymore. So getting over that and then firing the bad clients, I like that. Mm-hmm. So you've listened Maybe to the podcast either. for yeah. when? Sorry, when did ahead. you start listening to the podcast? Uh, about when I got my license. You know, just along the way, uh, just trying to figure out how to do this because um, those, those gosh darn real estate classes they just didn't teach you anything. <laughs> Like, so, yeah, you don't like everything on the class and the test isn't real. No. It's not, it's, it's well, it, it, like you don't actually apply that part for sure. No. So once I had my license, I, I joined, I accidentally joined an incredible brokerage. Thankfully, I'm not part of a team, but I'm in part of a, a brokerage that treats me like a team member. So that's also very, very valuable to join a, a really good brokerage. Um, so I started, but I needed to supplement the information I was getting from local because when things are done a certain way for so long, you need to bring in some more national influence. So listening to the podcast definitely trained my thinking on how to navigate this business as opposed to doing what's been done before. What's been done before. Yeah. You know, the, um, I think there are so many agents out there like you that are listening right now because I guess because of that, because if you are in a smaller community where there isn't a ton of agents, where there's not a whole bunch of people to learn from, like that's what our resource really is supposed to be, right? We're supposed to be that resource to tell people the secrets and tell people the stuff before there were, you know, entrepreneur groups, before there were masterminds, before there were teams and partnerships and people that would teach you. Can you think of anything that you heard on the podcast, any any interviews you liked in particular that were really helpful for you or tactics that you learned on there that you were able to apply? Gosh, I mean, every pot, like every podcast, there's a nugget, even if as a whole, I'm looking to listen to it. Uh, it's not really landing today, but there's always a nugget. I mean, just the one that I listened to this morning, uh, cannot remember her name, but uh, she just said, um, you know, we do our events, we do our events and, you know, we sometimes will rent out a movie theater and I'm like, Oh, that's a great idea. So I immediately booked yep. the movie theater. <laughs> so that yeah. got that going for my clients. I was like, I never thought of doing that. That was a great idea. So, I mean, in like the two seconds I listened to the podcast this morning, I immediately emailed the local movie theater and we've got that going. I mean, it's just those, those tiny nuggets. And also, of course, the, the action muscle. I love the action muscle because, uh, you've just got to do stuff. Um, it, you can read all the books, you can listen to all the podcasts, of course, and you can be an expert. It doesn't matter if you're not actually doing it. And uh, I had this, this silly little show that my kids used to watch on PBS. One of the songs was, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just doing it. And yeah. it plays in my head all day, every day, because you just, you're not going to be the expert. You can do this job for 50 years and still be blindsided. I mean, just surveying an easement this week. I didn't know how to do that this week. But I was like, I'm going to learn how and I'm going to be the expert. And if anybody has a question, you can come ask me. Um, and I didn't know how. And it's OK to not know how. And it's OK to always ask dumbest questions because chances are somebody else was too scared to ask it. And now I have the information and they don't. And that's why I'll be better. And if you're better, that gives you an edge. Like if you're the if it was easy, everybody would do it. And the and the bigger the problem that you can solve, the more extra value it is. That's why land entitlement is such like a lucrative business for the people that do it, because jumping through the hoops with the city and with the process is like, and then once they learn how, it's actually pretty easy. Right. But like if somebody first says, I bought this lot and I'm thinking about subdividing it, that's like so hard. But then you just start going and asking the questions and then um you know, if you guys hear anything from Amy's, like taking the notes, like I, I, I want to jump on that. If she said she listened to the podcast this morning and heard something 
And then she reached out to the movie theater right afterward. Every podcast you listen to of ours, I promise there will be a nugget. Right. I, pr- and sometimes I, I take like notes of like nine or 10 and sometimes it's one. But if you listen to our podcast, our goal is to be able to send that out to you guys and give you something new. So there will be a nugget, but then it's mm-hmm. up to you to go apply it. You know, and my interview with Brian Lubin was, was really great. And he, and the, because he talked so much about jumping into action, mm-hmm. like going like, we don't actually like doing a lot of the stuff that we do or we don't know how to do it, or we're uncomfortable, or we're stressed. And anything you ever did in your life, the first time you did it, you were stressed. First time you did it, it was hard. It was nervous. But he talked about jumping into action. And I love that. Like, so as you guys like finish today, as you, every time you listen to the podcast, you guys should be writing down a nugget, but then you should also take an extra 10 minutes and like do that first step of action for it. Because otherwise you're just wasting your time. We can tell you all the different things out there that you guys need to do. But if you can take a nugget and then also apply it. It's the first time I've had somebody tell me like, no, I heard something on the podcast. And a few minutes later, I, I went to implement that. And two months from now, it'll be part of my story. And it'll be part of that part of that thing where the, I mean, you guys are spending the time listening to us on the podcast today. You owe it to yourselves to take action with some of those items. Yeah, 100%. So do you have like a favorite transaction that you've done that by the time it finished, you were like, wow, I can't believe that that worked out or like something that just stands out and brings you, makes you smile. I'm actually in it right now. Oh, I just, it's just so happy. Um, we have a child with special needs and um, we need so much help. And we're not from here. Like I said, we don't have family. We don't have anybody jumping on these grenades for us. We rely so heavily on our community to get us through every single day. And there are, we have occupational therapists who have bought and sold houses with them. And, and right now we are, um, I got to sell the house for the person who gets my son through his day. Just, she's just there. And when she's not there, I know it the second he walks in the door and, uh, she asked me to sell her house. I was terrified. I'm like, please, can you please just ask somebody else to do it? Because if this goes bad, what am I going to do? And I sold her house in two hours. And it cl- and it's going to close early and no appraisal. Just it went great and it's wonderful and knock on wood. Don't have any wood, but um, she it's it just feels good to be able to support these people who support me through not just in real estate. That's fine, but support my family and get us through the day and members of our community that I respect and look up to and who give back so much. Me being able to serve them and uh, provide value it just feels so good to not be a lump on a log and to say no i'm i'm gonna sell your house i'm gonna sell it for more than what you think i can and i'm gonna sell it faster than you ever imagined yeah the amount of relief that you can give somebody when you do a great job as an agent Mm -hmm. right now is like there are plenty of times when the that then it's that this can be a job right? That it's just, you make money for effort and plenty of times where it's a lot of effort for not enough money. And like now it's frustrating. So it's so great when you get the, the big transactions where if we can remind ourselves, like you're changing somebody's life in every mm-hmm. one of these transactions, it makes it. Oh, I do, and I do have another one. I have another yeah. one that was my favorite too. Um, I, I probably should ask him for permission before I told it, but a uh, great guy, wonderful guy. He came to me and he's like, I want to be an investor. He's like, I want to sell something other than drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I sold him a duplex. He lives in one side. He rented out the other one. And he sent me this silly picture the other day. And he was pulled over on the side of the road and it was caught cars behind him. And he said, look, I got pulled over. It's the first time not getting arrested. Um, he turned his life around so much. And now he's a real estate investor. And he's like, next stop is being a millionaire. And it's uh, being a real estate agent. Yeah, we make some money, but we know that the real power is in investing. You know that. The real power is there and being able to see somebody just just scrape their scrape it together, just scrape it together just enough to buy their very first piece of dirt and say, This is this is where my I'm gonna raise my kids and that's what's gonna pay my mortgage next door. It's just it's an it's a really, really cool feeling. Yeah. What a great place to start to buy a duplex, you live in one side, you rent mm-hmm. out the other. It's the first time you realize like that you're that you're getting to start to win and get out of the red like that very first step. You know, mm-hmm. you start to win, get out of that rat race where you're not, you're not paying your full mortgage anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Someone else is helping you pay that full mortgage. You got discount, you've got a discounted bill on your side. You know, one of the questions we ask is your favorite podcast. And you said the miracle morning was the, 
was, was one of your was one of your favorites on there. Yes. And so the so t- just tell me about that. Um, you know, it's just important of getting ahead of the day and not falling behind and just getting your crap together. And it's it's tough. It's I mean, it's tough because it's so cold here. It's negative fifty five. Mm-hmm. You don't want to get out of bed, but you have to. You got to get your day going. And uh, it's just it's important to to make sure that you carve out that time in your day to reflect on what's actually not just what's going to happen in your day, but what happened in the day before that was actually worth mem- remembering and valuing and honoring. Um, there's something that I, I recently started doing instead of a bucket list, bucket list. Oh, wait, what do you want to do? It's like a reverse bucket list, like turn around and go, oh, my crap. Look at what I did. Look what I did. I got, I've got a yeah. beautiful house. I have a beautiful family. I have the, the best marriage uh, that I ever could have thought I could have had with my wonderful husband. And to look back at these things that I've accomplished and go, well, that wasn't a disaster. I can do this day. This isn't a big deal. Look at everything I already did. My bucket list is secondary to my reverse bucket list. Yeah. You know, for people listening too, like if you call it your reverse bucket list, if you call it your gratitude list, like I do my, I do daily affirmations. I learned first from Hal Elrod's Miracle Morning. Hal was one of our speakers at our mastermind last year out in Austin. Good buddy of mine now. I'd never met him when I read his book. Um, but I like to, you know, part of that, you know, the, the, the gratitude or the reverse bucket list is I go, thank you that I was able to do this last year, this last year, and this last year. And sometimes it's thank you for that trip. Thank you that we were able to pay for my daughter's medical expenses. Thank you that we were able to go to Arkansas for six months and that we were able to, we had the ability uh, to work through that. Thank you that I sold that one house right before the market turned. Thank you that I refinanced our our, our main house before uh, at the, I, I, you know, I missed refining on a bunch of my investments, but I refined my personal house at the absolute lowest possible amount ever at the absolute peak of the market, the most that house had ever been worth. So you could have these wins. And you, when you remember the wins and you stay grateful, and then we start to go, and now here's what I'm going to do this next year. It helps bring your goals to the top, but also make them less scary or less like, look, yeah, look what I've already done. Look what I've already done. This next year is nothing in that comparison as you guys try to look uh, at your stats for what's next. So the, so are you slowing down on your, uh, your own investment purchases right now? No, never. Unfortunately, some days I, I manage all of our single families. I recently handed over all the apartments. Um, there are some days like on Monday, I'm just, uh, you know, we snake in a main waistline, making sure there's not roots in it. And <laughs> it's just, yeah. that's, I mean, it's a lot of balance. Um, I like our investments. They're, they're my babies. I love that. I, I got to make my literal blood, sweat and tears are inside of those homes of replacing flooring and ripping out carpet and painting and just doing the, doing all of that, that work that goes into it and to be able to take care of our tenants, which we really do have phenomenal tenants that I I do cherish and appreciate very much. Hey, real estate rock stars. We only have a few minutes left in this episode, but before we get to the grand finale, I just want to say as always, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. You know, podcasts are obviously free. You don't have to pay to listen to the podcast, but if you could pay one thing, if I could charge you one thing, to listen to this podcast, what I would ask you to do is go, please make a review. Go to wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's on YouTube or on Apple or Android, wherever you listen to podcasts and go give me a review of the podcast. I read them. I listen to them. I try to make adjustments. You know, a couple of years ago, I had a ton of bad reviews on the sound quality or the number of advertisements, things like that. And I've really tried to dial in to add value for all of you guys. So please, please, please go do a review. If you want to get a, a, a copy of the toolbox of the stuff that you know, everybody that comes on the show, they give us some tactics, they give us something that we put in what we call our toolbox. And so to get that, you go to realestaterockstarsnetwork.com. When you get there, click on the, the toolbox and you get access to the free gift that every person that we interview on the episode provides. There's things like, you know, uh, listing tactics, how to do a presentation, you know, how to do a newsletter, all sorts of cool, fun stuff. And if you want to talk to me, go find me on Instagram at Aaron Amuchastegui. Ask me a question. I talked to so many of you guys on there. All right, back to the show. Thanks again for being a listener. Yeah. Have there been any price corrections up there yet? Not really. It's been kind of crazy. So our, our days on market in 2021, um, 
were actually longer than in 2022. And then our months of inventory that we have currently, we're at like two, two and a half months of inventory. Our inventory is super low. And I'm still, I mean, we're still selling stuff. We're still getting multiple offers, still selling stuff quick. I mean, we didn't experience the boom to the extent that the, na- the, the nation experienced the boom um, because our local economy had actually experienced a, a huge boom 10 years prior that we had been correcting off of so long. So that when the interest rates did drop so much and demand did increase, it didn't, we all had in the back of our heads of, all right, we don't want another one of those booms that we had 10 years ago that people never really recovered from. Yeah. You know, the, so that's, so it's good. They have different markets have different tra- trends. What we saw in the last years, I heard about a lot of people moving to Montana to South Dakota, Mm -hmm. to Idaho, to Texas. People are moving from New York to Florida or California to Idaho or Montana. People are moving to these areas where there's like less bustle, less Mm -hmm. boom. That's why I first even went to Texas. I'd experienced the housing boom and the housing crash in California. So when I first Mm -hmm. uh, moved out to Texas, started buying here, I wanted to go somewhere where there would be no boom. Mm-hmm. At that time, prices had never gone up in Texas. They were never going to go down. And so I started investing heavily out here in Austin. And and that could be like similar to North Dakota now, right? So the so as people move around, have a bunch of people move to North Dakota and or tell us about North Dakota. Like tell us about where you are when people are thinking about like like what's up there. Someone's considering moving to Montana or to, you know, to to South Dakota or Idaho. What's what's up in North Dakota? North Dakota's the best place on earth. My husband's in the Air Force, so we've gotten to live all over the country. And the we lived in six states in seven years. Um, so when we got here, our plan was to only be here for three years. And the very first second I got here, I said, nope, I'm done. This is it. I'm not leaving. This is the happiest place on earth. It's gorgeous year round. Yeah, it's cold. The people, you'll never meet anybody like them. It's just, it's incredible. Um, the towns are small. The people are nice. The taxes are reasonable. It's a great place to start a small business. We love our small businesses here. They fare better than the chains. Um, it's a phenomenal place. It's a great place to come. I encourage anybody, if you want to take a trip, come to North Dakota, move to North Dakota, big business, small business. This is a phenomenal place. And time and time again, when people step foot into the state, they say, that's it. I'm done. I'm staying here forever. The so then kind of a last question is for anybody out like for anybody out there that's thinking about becoming an agent. Like, what would you tell them? Like, because there's going to be people right now that are listening that are people that just got laid off because the world changed a little bit in some of these bigger cities. Some aren't having as much fun in where they are. The what about um, you know? So what would you what would you tell the people that are thinking should I become a real estate agent? And why? Um, if you're thinking about becoming a real estate agent, the very first step is marry well. <laughs> There's been times <laughs> that my, my phone has rang and it's that client. You're just like, man, I'm just not in the mood. And the, the, my husband goes, you answer it. That's a very, very per- important person. Yes, they're high maintenance. Yes, they're difficult, but they deserve your time and your energy. Or when I'm getting a Zillow lead and I don't want to deal with a Zillow lead right there. He went, nope, that's a million dollars right there. And also when my husband says, those people are jerks and we don't need the money that bad. Um, The amount of patience and understanding that you need to have from a spouse to do real estate because people say, oh, I want to be a real estate agent because the hours are flexible. It's all the hours. Now it's just, it's all of them now. It's not nine to five. Now it's all of them. How is this flexible? So to have that. Yeah. The, um, I remember the, uh, one of the things that David Osborne said says on stage is he talks about you can just work half time if you're a real estate agent. You just have to figure out what twelve hours of the day uh, you're going to work. The um, <laughs> only so, twelve anyway. That's yeah, and only twelve, only twelve a day. Amy, this was a lot of fun. The um, I think those are some great you know final thoughts for people on here. The I love getting to interview people that are newer agents that are just crushing it. I love getting to interview people that have been listening to the podcast and like you've developed these like friendships and relationships, but they're very one sided because you're getting to listen and apply the stuff with your mentors. I love that you got to come on here today and share 
with other people. Um, any final thoughts and or if nothing else, just tell people how can they reach out to you if they want to know more about what you're doing, if they want to know more about North Dakota, if they want to keep in touch, what's the best way somebody can find you? Uh, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. I'm Amy Rogers or Amy Rogers Real Estate. And uh, email address, amy at brokers12.com. Reach out. Give me a call. Come up here. We'll go get uh, go get a burger, get a sandwich, some coffee or something. Absolutely. Cool. Amy, this was so much fun. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's so great to get to meet you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Real Estate Rockstars, thanks for listening. 